So, who in this room has a brain? <laughs> okay, everybody has a brain, so um, I think this is a good, a good thing because this enabled us to listen to the TED Talks that came before me, to move, to sit, to feel, to be social, to be antisocial, <laughs> to laugh, to sing. So I'm going to tell you why mapping the brain and understanding its anatomy and function is important to understand ourselves and also important to understand brain disorder. So here I have a plastic brain, which is sort of life-size. It would fit in my head. And as you see, it's a bit pinkish and it's really like folded which is super convenient because in this way you actually have a much bigger surface than the brain is. And the brain, I'll just put this here, it has multiple regions or lobes. So you have the cortex, which is here. You have the cerebellum, also called the little brain, the brain stem, subcortical regions, which you don't really see here, and also the corpus callosum, which is like the bridge between the two halves of the brain. So, looking inside the brain, we have a map here. You see also that there's a cortex, which is in light gray, and below it is the white matter, which is conveniently here in black, because I inverted the image. So, importantly, the white matter connects the regions of your cortex and helps them to form a network, which is also seen here. So, you have regions that are connected. And looking at the anatomy of the brain, this was something researchers, or in general, people started to care about around like mid 1900th uh, century, because before they didn't really thought the brain was that important for our thoughts, for our minds. But then they thought maybe, maybe it is a cool organ. Maybe we should look at it further. And actually, the brain, although it's pink here, it has a variable cytoarchitecture. So the layers of the brain they have different distributions of cells depending on which region. And this tells us also something about the function that it's processing. So right here, you have the central circus and the somatocentric cortex. And this is the region where you feel and move. And here in the back, there's the visual cortex, which is roughly the region that helps us see. But between these regions, there's a lot of brain, I can tell you that. And these regions, they help us to pay attention to feel your feelings or to interpret your feelings and control them, but also to have theory of mind, to think about the minds of other peoples, but also thinking about your own perspective. So what is kind of what I find super cool is that these structures, they are organized in a certain hierarchical way. So the most distance from these primary regions that support seeing, feeling, moving, our functions that support our social, our abstract mind, that help us to detach from reality, but also help us to cross the boundary from within my head to your head. Because in this way, we can also be social and understand other people, and we can cooperate, think about their mind, think how we all can act together, such as in a climate crisis. So it is super relevant to know how it works and what is the biology of this, not only to understand the brain and the mind, but also to understand what is the biology that helps us to act together and overcome our boundaries. So the pink brain is cool. I like holding it, I like puzzling with it, but it's of course not a real brain, right? So the question is, how can we look at a brain? Because we all have it, but it's, it's inside our skull, and like I could kill you all and look at your brains, but that would be, well, not so productive and a bit morbid, and also a bit stationary, because then I will have one state of your brain. So what we do have, and which is a great thing, is that we have MRI, which stands for Magnetic Resonance Imaging. And this is, maybe some of you have been in an MRI scanner. This is like a big magnet, and it pulsates, so you magnetize the hydrogen molecules or look in your head or in your body, and you move them to a certain direction, so you change their so-called spin, and then they start resonating. And with radio frequency um, coils, you can measure differences in how they spin, and by this way, using physics and Fourier transformations, re-infer 
the photo of your brain and make a figure like the one above here. And using different um, technical approaches, you can measure different aspects of the brain, such as its function, its structure, and its connectivity. So speaking about connectivity, you see here these nicely colored um, well, pathways between regions. And this is a way to, to understand how brain regions are connected. And this is an example of structural connectivity, but you have also functional connectivity, which points to the same thing, because it's all about the relationship between different brain regions and, and how this matters to our function and our, to our understanding of our mind. So I work a lot with networks, and previously there was also a talk about computer science, and, and I like this, yeah, using computational approaches to understand big, complicated systems, such as our brain. And above me, you see a twin, a pair of twins. They're also NASA astronauts, which is great, <laughs> but for now it's more important that they're monozygotic twins, which means that they're genetically about 100% identical. On the other hand, we all know about dizygotic twins, and they, they are not 100% identical, they're about 50% identical. And then we also have cousins, for example, which is about 25% identical. So in this way, you can get a so-called pedigree tree of genetic similarity. And using this information, and using the information that we have on the brain, we can compare how heritable a, of a specific feature is of our behavior or our brain. And in this way, we know what is the role of genetics in a certain aspect of brain organization. And this is a thing I'm curious about, because we have this brain, but how did it come the way it is, and how much of it is genetically determined, and, and if so, why? And to answer the why question, we also have to look at evolution, because we're humans, but we're also primates, and non-human primates, such as the macaque monkey you see over there, they also have a brain, and it's roughly similar to that of humans, but there are also a lot of differences. And by understanding what are the similarities between humans and, for example, macaques, we can know what evolution, evolutionary changed, but also what remained the same, and what are the evolutionary organizational principles that shape our brain and also shape our mind. So what I found was that there are two main organizational axes that sort of shape the brain and organize the brain and, and determine where a certain region may be. And one of them goes from the back here to the front of the brain. And this is, has to do with neurogenesis, so the time point at which new neurons are born and also how these neurons behave, whether they're really well connected or more local phenomena. And interestingly, this axis also relates from vision to abstract thought. So there's also like more a behavioral relevance to this axis. The other axis went from the bottom, bottom to the upside, so the inferior to the superior part of your brain. And this axis relates to a theory of the dual origin, it's called, and it says that like, the brain has like, a differentiable cytoarchitecture, so, so cells of different brain regions, they look different in a sort of systematic way in the brain, and this relates to the distance of these two origins, which are called the hippocampus, and the olfactory cortex, but you can immediately forget it. But what is important that this is also a relevant organizational principle of the brain, and it's seen in humans and macaques, and it's heritable. And the upper part helps us understand where a thing is, in a broad sense of where it is. And the lower part helps us understand what is it, and what does it mean for us. So great. Axis, brain, mapping, compass, maybe we can like know where we are and how evolution and genes shaped, shaped what is inside our head, but yeah, what does it mean for our thoughts? Like, aren't we all like learning here in school and if it's all genetically determined, like, can we change? And am I, when I have my thoughts, I, I quit my goal. Is this because my parents gave me these genes or because of evolution? <laughs> well, no, luckily, luckily not. The brain is also built in a way that we can be flexible, we can adapt we can adapt to this changing environment. We can act upon the climate crisis because our brain is built like it is. So we can, we can change, or in different ways, of course, and, and sometimes we cannot change, but in principle, we're adaptive beings. We can move. 
So one of the question is then what happens? How can we change? And how can we train our minds to be more attentive, to be more compassionate, to take more perspective? And this is a study I did in my, um, or I started in my PhD in the lab of Tanya Singer. And we trained like three different skills. The first one was about presence. And this is like feeling attention, feeling that you are in a body, feeling this interoceptive feeling um, and understanding your breath. So maybe we can dim the lights a bit and then we can do a quick exercise here to become a little bit more present in case you are not there yet. So the lights are a bit dimmed now, slowly. And then if you want, you can close your eyes, if you trust me, but you can keep them open. And you start breathing slowly, And then you feel your toes getting warm. And this warmth, this attentive warmth, creeps up to your ankles, to your knees, to your hips. And now you pay attention to your whole leg, and it's warm. Then the warmth creeps up to your belly button, to your breasts, your shoulders. And then also your fingers get warm, your elbows, your shoulders, the point of your nose, your eyebrows, and then the upper part of your head. So you now feel this attentive warmth in your whole body and maybe breathe out once or twice and open your eyes again. And thank you for undimming the lights. So this was an exercise to feel more attentive of your body and, and like that we're all part of, not only, we're not only in our head, we're also a body, right? And another important feature that we've also talked about relative to refugees in Moria, for example, is feeling compassion for other people, feeling feelings of care and, and, and caring for people even that we don't know. And this is, this is something that is not always natural to us, right? We love the people we love, we have our friends, but apart from that, like, do we really care about the lady at the supermarket, even if she's like neutrally friendly? So an exercise to, to try to improve this is loving kindness meditation. And in doing so, you first feel this loving and kindness that you hopefully feel for some of your family members and for your friends. And then you expand this to the nice lady or mister in the supermarket, to the maybe not so friendly lady at the bakery. And then you expand it further to the people you don't know. For example, I feel this for you guys in the audience. I don't know you well, but I can feel loving kindness for you. And then you expand it also to people you really don't know that are far away, maybe in the camps of Moria. And then you exercise to feel this also for people you don't understand and don't know. And by feeling this loving kindness and practicing this feeling of warmth towards people you don't know, you can also maybe increase your compassion. And on the other hand, compassion and having feelings, it also has to do with emotions and understand that I have positive emotions, I have negative emotions in myself, and other people have it, and I don't always understand the emotions my friends or my kids or my partner feel, but talking about them and realizing other people have feelings too is a helpful thing. So we did this dyadic exercise with one other partner, and the idea was you speak for five minutes, in two minutes or two and a half, you say the positive things of your day, what made you feel happy. For example, I was happy the sun was shining this morning. It made me feel really, really great. And, and the coffee tastes so, so good this morning. It made me feel super happy. And I'm so thankful for being here and that the coffee is OK. Like, this really made my day. But on the other hand, I also have some negative emotions. For example, um, my kid has this problem with getting dressed. Like, like he makes 
huge tantrums. He's two, so it's normal, but still, it's really like making me also sad and angry that it's always like this, this fight with him, like 15 minutes, and I have to like hold him really tightly, and still he doesn't understand he needs a new diaper. And as a parent, this is just like, <laughs> takes so much energy. And then, and then I have to be here, and I'm tired, and nobody cares, and you know, so that's, that's two things of me, and I, I bet you guys always have also positive and negative emotions about your day. So by sharing this and listening also, and listening is important to other people's feelings, you might also be able to, to improve your compassion and to get more aware of your emotions. On the other hand, all emotions are cool, but luckily we're not only emotional people. We also have um, a cognitive, a rational side. And this is about having perspectives and different roles in your life. So on the one hand, you can take perspective on your own thoughts. You can watch them go by. You can think, okay, I'm, I'm like in a train station of my own mind and I see my mind think, oh God, I'm bored. <laughs> or, okay, yeah, <laughs> what am I doing here? What is, what is she talking about? Or uh, interesting the brain, uh -huh, yeah. But on the other hand, you also have different roles in yourself. So earlier I mentioned I'm a mother, but I'm also, well, the child of two people. And, and these are different roles to my parents. I, I can still also act like a child, but to my kids, ideally I don't. I'm the adult there. And right now I'm, I'm giving you kind of a lecture, right? I'm explaining you about the brain, but I also, I know a bit about the brain, obviously, but I'm also, I learn still, I'm also still a student. And, and these roles, they of course also like, change the way I approach a certain situations. And I guess everybody in this room is also a child of parents, right? And, and is also a student, a person that is still learning, but is also teaching other people what is right and wrong, maybe. <laughs> so, so by acknowledging these roles and also telling about a certain perspective about a certain life event, you, and recognizing that other people also talk about a certain perspective about their life events, you can get a better, it's called theory of mind, so understand that people have a different mind than you and a different perspective from where they come from. And also by understanding it, it might also be easier to, to break the boundaries that are within me and the boundary that is in you. So maybe when I talked about my kids, some people that are also parents were like, I, 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 I know this. So you kind of bond by sharing a, a certain aspect of you. So cool, well, social behavior, complex behaviors, I guess a lot of examples already came by in the talks before me. And what is kind of for me as a well, neuroscientist, it's also cool that these behaviors relate to different networks, so to call, and regions of the brain. And for convenience, they're colored yellow, which is attention, red, which is this compassion, emotion, and on the other hand, green, which is this theory of mind, taking perspective. And what to me, as a, as a more network-based interested person and also interested in the topology and place of functions and behavior in the brain, it's super nice that they have a sequence, right? Like It's like yellow, red, green yellow, red, green. It's a pattern that, that emerges all over the brain. There seems to be some logic to it. And this might also tell us something about the evolution and the genetic development and background of these regions. But <coughs> I guess this is nice, but yeah, you were maybe curious, like, okay, you can do these exercises. And, and we did this for three months, each of these three blocks with people, and we scanned them before and after. And before I said the brain is a network, so let's say this is a brain, and these are the regions, and these are the connections. So when you're alive, the brain can integrate and segregate, so regions can become relatively functionally more similar or more dissimilar. And what we found when you do this mindfulness attention, so you do sort of a relaxation, is that also your brain, oh, your brain doesn't relax, but in a way it relaxes because regions, they become more segregated from each other. On the other hand, when you do this effortful theory of mind and think about your own perspectives and other perspectives, that's not always easy. And also your brain responds like that. And you see that regions, they, they integrate more and they become closer together because this makes information processing across different networks more efficient. And on the other hand, we didn't find any significant results for, for emotions, but what it might be is that emotions are like the glue that balance these two 
endpoints, so to say, of segregation and integration. So to me, this is super exciting. Like, I, I don't understand every aspect of it, but like, it, it's super exciting how, how this dy dynamic network that is the brain can change with experience and also can learn. So, great. I'm a basic researcher. Um, I, I, I do a lot of statistics behind my computer. I, I calculate p-values, which tell us how relevant it is. And I told you about the brain and about some evolution, some theory. And OK, but, but what does it mean? And, and I already tried to convey why understanding the brain can also help us understand not how to deal with the climate crisis, but why it's so difficult to make people cooperate and how to, how to improve that and how to reach people. And we all have minds, and it is relevant to know how they work. Because on the one hand, we can understand behavior a little bit better, and also how to change it. But on the other hand, I read that one in four people have a mental or neurological disorder during their lifetime. And maybe some of you know people or are those people that have these issues. And it's really hard to cure or, or to help these people that suffer from such conditions. And my, my hope is that by mapping the brain and understanding, on the one hand, its evolution and its genetic basis, and on the other hand, also how it might change in healthy people and understanding whether such changes can also occur in people with disorder, this helps us really to understand maybe disease and, and to find new cures or approaches to connect with these people. So with that, I, I want to close, and, and I believe really that mapping the brain helps us to understand where we are and where we want to be. Thank you.